So when looking at the artwork of the old masters, we'll see angels everywhere, and if it is not the angels, it will be some other flying fairy creatures, and then angels, angels at every special occasion, angels and even more angels everywhere. Why is that? In school, we were told that people were simply dumb and that's why the clergy, the church, took advantage of this and put in their heads imaginary things that do not actually exist. If people were indeed that dumb, we should have been seeing a completely different type of art. For example, compositions of this type would be much more suitable. Art of the people who really can't think for themselves doesn't stretch much far beyond than depicting simple objects of one's surrounding food and basically that's it. But in the old works we see something completely different, we see complex compositions, clearly made by people who are perfectly capable of thinking for themselves. And even further, just notice how much attention, concentration and skill did they invest even in the smallest details of their artwork. Now to understand why people were painting like crazy things that they don't see, or were they actually seeing things that we don't see, or what is going on, let's first understand why we automatically assume that they were painting things that they don't see. First of all, most modern people think that angels are imaginary, and if you ask a person that considers himself rational, why do you think angels are imaginary? He will tell you, first of all, uh, you can't see them in the scientific laboratory, for example. Okay, but there are so many minute particles and all kinds of scientifically sounding things that people strongly believe in and yet they cannot see themselves. They only need to take the honest word of a couple of scientists who supposedly isolated the given particle or virus or whatever. So in other words, it's again a matter of belief of, uh, in the words of a few given people, which is in no way different uh, than believing the words of, uh, let's say, a priest a few thousand years ago. There is no difference at all. It's a matter of blind belief in somebody that you trust. So, so far, there is no really, really rational idea uh, for which to consider the angels imaginary. Well, now let's think of another possible idea coming from the so-called uh, rational people, or at least people who consider themselves rational. Now somebody else may say, no, I don't believe the clergy, I don't believe the scientists as well, I cannot see angels, that's why they don't exist. And yet, such a rational person, even after saying this about angels, he will firmly believe that all the other continents exist and all these other countries that you see on the map. But wait a minute, you haven't seen them all with your own eyes. But still, you are convinced that they exist. And actually, if uh, we look without any prejudice, we'll notice that there are much more witness reports about angels than people who have seen Antarctica, an entire continent.
So again at the end, it boils down to fate, whom do you choose to believe? Yet another group of people who consider themselves rational will say, you know, I don't say that uh, everything is visible. I just don't believe in the angels because the scientists who have equipment to see even uh, spectrums of the light that we don't perceive with uh, our common eyes, they haven't told us yet that angels exist. That's why I don't believe it, not because I don't see myself. Now, this is simply a case of gross misinformation, uh, because many scientists have done excellent jobs and many volumes have been published by absolutely mainstream scientists who have studied, for example, near-death experiences and have uh, provided convincing details of people who have met angels, they report that after being uh, in a state of uh, clinical death. And not only they uh, tell about the angels, but also entire stories of the surroundings, for example, how they were watching uh, the surgery rooms or the hospitals where their bodies were laying dead. And many of them provide uh, detail of uh, what uh, people were doing at that time, details that they could not have seen if the spirit was really dead, although the body was dead. So this is a completely rational proof that their stories are not fantasy or hallucination. And it is not a single story. They are in thousands and they are well documented. So the misunderstanding is to confuse the information presented by the mass media and schools as actually scientific. Uh, in terms of history, in my other videos, I provided, provided countless examples in which historians do excellent job, find things, even sometimes manage to publish it and gain publicity. But still, there is no result. It doesn't get included in the official history of the schools and people think that the one taught in school is the scientific conclusion but that's not that's uh, is some uh, mass media history conclusion propaganda history conclusion not really scientific one and the same is the confusion with angels which includes all other fairy furry flying cute creatures in terms of quantity, we have more than enough. Also, we have uh, plenty of historic eyewitness accounts and then modern ones that have been confirmed by near-death experiences. Also, people who are um, able to travel in astral um, dimensions. These are not all these... Um, so-called uh, people who channel spirits and charge uh, one or two hundred euros per hour to talk to them on Skype. No, these are real people like uh, Monroe in uh, the States from the previous uh, generation. He also proved a lot. He was a genuine guy or some shamans like I recently interviewed, uh, Carlos uh, Tanner. And then the vast amount of near-death experiences, that is probably the strongest evidence of all. And uh, then a lot of cases uh, from past life regressions, those also regularly deal with angels. And uh, they have uh, proven again and again that they do have a validity, that they are not a, a hallucination. So the amount of proof about the actual existence of these astral creatures is overwhelming. It is only a question of whom do you choose to believe when you form your belief system, your personal opinion of what is reality and what is not. Now let's get back to the art of the old masters with the angels all over. Were they really imagining those angels just because they believed in them? Or were they really seeing angels all over and that's why they painted them? Now from the set books of Jane Roberts and few other sources we find out that the people we call cavemen, they actually had a fully developed 
astral vision, they could freely see the spirits around and only gradually as man decided to consider himself separate of the so-called dead nature, he lost his this type of vision. Maybe the cavemen were somewhat similar to what is now alive and amongst us, hopefully still, we haven't killed them all, the Sasquatch, they, are, they also lead simple lives, maybe living in a burrow or something like that, and many cases show that they are skilled, proficient in uh, using the astral plane. For example, when they meet some of us, usually they have to resort to running and hiding. That's what we deserve. That's what we have earned with our kindness to them. And uh, and then so many witness accounts are there that they disappear. And that is how we usually name this uh, phenomenon, disappearance. But they don't really disappear. We simply can't perceive them anymore. So the cavemen, who are part of our heritage, we originated from them partially. They had this type of vision. And also the more advanced beings that mixed with them and that educated them, who are also uh, kind of forefathers to us, they definitely had disabilities as well. And we didn't lose them overnight as well. It happened gradually as we entered uh, more and more into this modern belief system that the nature around is dead, basically. And so the medieval artists who were painting angels just everywhere, they were nearer than us, the modern man, to those times when people could openly mix with angels and see them. And that is why many of the paintings with angels, because we see those angels above every important historic event that has been depicted in um, these paintings, more or less. So uh, probably these were based in many cases on actual witness accounts. But let's see, what is the situation with the angels in modern times, when artists can paint whatever they wish. So it turns out their artwork is again full of angels and flying creatures. Just they are somewhat of a different kind. Yes, exactly these creatures with non-attractive appearance is what in religious terms it's called evil angels or evil spirits. And it's not just the angels. A very large portion of the modern art consists of depictions of things that people a few centuries ago would call satanic or devilish. For example, skulls, they are an extremely popular object of depiction in all forms of modern art. So do you think that it is just a random coincidence that in the times that we live now, when qualities that are definitely considered ungodly, like dishonesty, cruelty, unkindness, stupidity, and all like this, are getting more and more common, and allegedly, by pure chance, at the same time, in art, we see depiction of all these symbols that centuries ago, according to the belief system in that time, would be classified as uh, demonic and devilish skulls and all these uh, attributes of suffering and the evil. The artists who depict such things nowadays are usually far away from any religious concepts behind these objects. But don't you notice that the same old symbols stand for the same qualities even nowadays? Only the outside packaging, the label is different, but the essence of all things is the same. So people never stopped using symbols of the dark and light side in their daily lives. They always remained all around. Just in the past, people were more educated as of the power of these symbols and the influence that they have on our psyche. 
While in modern times people consider the symbols to be simply fantasy and mostly they consider it laughable to think that the symbols could have power, for example, over real events that happen to us, suggesting anything of this sort would sound highly unscientific to common men nowadays. But let's see if that is really so. In my previous videos, I proved that what is taught and the banner of science in schools and preached on mass media is not necessarily the conclusions of uh, real scientists, and very often they are simply things that those who rule the planet currently wish the simple people should believe in. When I say the people who rule us, I mean those parties that will tell your president what to do. So on one side, this handful of people who rule behind the scenes want the common men to think that uh, all this religion is mostly just uh, fantasy, nothing real, somebody's sick hallucinations, while they themselves are always members of some sort of secret society or a cult organization, something like that. And they would be flashing some sort of uh, magical symbols, often in public. Why would they do it? If this had no power, how come a handful of people controls so many millions, an entire planet against the will of the people? Well, I explained all this in detail in my documentary of over 40 episodes called The Survivors of Atlantis. I wanted to show with many practical examples how the belief system of the people was gradually twisted and stealing of our history is only part of it. I did so in, in, with the intention to inspire people to gradually get disentangled from this reality of lies that we have been artificially placed in. Not just the religious symbols and the angels and the stolen history. Countless other aspects of the modern belief system have been twisted in very vicious way by the forces of evil and until we don't correct all these problems there will be no way to manifest a beautiful world of peace and indeed the very knowledge of how practically our thoughts materialize and turn into actual events or fate destiny that's how we call it because now we feel powerless against it Actually, that is us. It is not a punishment from God or something that happens to us by chance. This is how our forefathers in deep antiquity saw the world around, not as dead matter, elements of nature that are against us, that we need to master and control. They saw it as something alive, something that responds to our intention and thoughts. I personally rediscovered this ancient law for myself independently during my own meditation quests, quests for truth and happiness. But since I'm aware how strange and weird would it sound for most people, things like the plants have spirits that you can talk with or that natural disasters are caused by your own thoughts. That is why I decided to try to help people to reach to these realizations by themselves by showing them how you see how your own forefathers believed in these things. And since many artifacts and historic sites show that those forefathers were more elevated than you, then maybe you would consider that their view of the world, their philosophy could be also probably very beneficial for you. Sadly, most of the viewers of the documentary took it as an entertainment, as some sort of curious speculations about megaliths. Yes, it increased the awareness of the fact that um, the official story is just uh, unreal fantasies. But very few people, unfortunately, 
honestly considered to make some endeavor towards trying to change their belief system to what it was in deep antiquity. For example, if I post a video called I figured out from which constellation the parasites come and I suggest a practical plan to combat them. This video will get lots of views and uh, actually lots of people will even share it with their friends. Because it endorses their current belief system, for example, that there are other stars rotating around other suns, and then it endorses this deeply rooted belief in us since childhood. We are taught that anybody who makes us feel inconvenient can be fought against. In other words, we have the right to attack and harm somebody because we feel that he has caused us inconvenience. But if I post a video called How, with the power of your thoughts, you can have only good things happening to you, it will not get much attention. People will not even bother watching because they think that it, this is self-evidently not practical. I did get many emails and comments that uh, my videos are inspiring and uplifting. That's why I made a few surveys, actually written surveys, about what exactly do they inspire you for, how do they uplift you, what is the actual difference. And unfortunately I found out that uh, less than 1% of the viewers reach the conclusions that I was expecting to be reached after watching the videos. But then what was most shocking from the results of these surveys that I made was the answer to the following question. Imagine they really start marking people with the mark of the beast as it is described in the Bible. Will you accept it? I mean, this is hypothetically. An imaginary, hypothetical situation that such a marking really takes place. I'm not saying it will take place, maybe it will not, but even if it doesn't, it is a kind of a symbol, uh, symbolizing the person accepting openly to belong to the demonic races. That's how I see it. And what were the survey results? Only less than 40% actually selected, no, no way, I will not accept it. And the most surprising was uh, how many people in this survey shared that uh, yes, I believe in the Bible prophecies, I believe that they are happening in front of our eyes, but as far as the mark of the beast, I will have no choice, I'll have to accept it, otherwise they will kill me. So this fear of death, which by itself is absolutely unreasonable because we never die, we never stop to exist, dominates the psyche of the modern man to such an un un unimaginable extent that even those who do not watch TV get infected by it by birth because they get raised in an environment where such fear is understood to be something self-evident and because in daily life they are surrounded by people who also assume that death is also something frightening and cannot be anything else ever. This fear has gained the control over the thinking process of modern men to such an extent that absolutely normal people cease to think, stop to think, when it comes to it. For example, people who consider themselves Christian and consider themselves believers in the Bible, they are telling me that they will be having no choice but to accept the mark of the beast. What is the use of all their belief in the Bible if they don't believe in such a pivotal point that the mark is fully optional and this will be your test? And then in relation to the survivor's documentary, so many people were commenting and writing, please, we must find a way to combat the parasites, to fight back. But the very idea of violence and fighting is parasitic by itself. And as long as we maintain any such 
parasitic ideas, our own psyche becomes a breeding ground for the evil. We have become partially parasites ourselves. For example, we consider natural and absolutely self-evident and the only way to react is to hate somebody who causes us inconvenience. We think this is automatic and there is no other way, but we just assume that this is so, because that is all we have seen. This is how we have been brought up. In this way, we host multitude of parasitic beliefs and this is what turns us into parasites. If we want to live on heavenly earth, we need to develop the qualities and belief system of angels. And the first step towards doing that is understanding that our current belief system is not an absolute one, absolute and only possible reality, it is just an option. It has been given to us during the process of upbringing and it is something that we can change consciously. The transition to an angelic society on earth will start not when some external force is defeated. This force is actually deeply rooted within us. And when we destroy the roots, the trunk of the tree will die by itself. We supply nutrition to the evil daily with our anger, with our depressions, with our ugly thought forms, with our dirty language full of swearing, with the demonic symbols that we accept in our environment because we believe that they are innocent decoration and many, many other forms. Once we stop giving this nutrition, the trunk of the evil and the full tree will die. First, you start to develop and manifest angelic qualities yourself and you start do all the thinking by yourself instead of adopting the thoughts from the mass media as if they are your own. Second, spending minimal time in educating oneself about the actual forces that drive our current society. And third, making sure that your viewpoint as of what kind of changes need to be done to the social structure of governing are properly heard by the authorities that are currently in charge of um, representing the public opinion. And the easiest example of that would be voting. For example, most people agree that uh, the forces of evil, they are primary tools for taking over the control of human society is the monetary system and the military power. Let's start with the monetary system. Is it being maintained by some sort of aliens that we can't see? No, not at all. Actually, it has been engineered and put in place by the people that we voted for, at least our majority. Now and then, during elections, even in places like US and other countries, candidates emerge that openly talk against this evil financial system and propose honest money. Honest money and honest taxation automatically will reduce drastically wars because the war budget will reduce drastically. But people don't vote for these candidates. They don't find that appealing and important. Other factors are more important, like, for example, to which party the particular candidate belongs to. During the election campaigns for the most uh, important positions in the society, the candidates prefer to exchange personal insults instead of proposing practical ways of uh, killing this evil of the financial, dishonest financial system which suffocates us, basically. And people have become so superficial that they listen to this type of campaigns and eventually even vote. Sometimes practical promises are also made and some of them are beautiful. Unfortunately, we have seen how much these uh, elected people indeed lie. They have been telling something during their campaign and they do exactly the opposite when they come in office. But the masses seem to be ready to swallow that up. They do it all the time. Uh, millions of people are members of all kinds of uh, 
parties and all kinds of uh, minor details are discussed in countless meetings. How many people stand up and s propose? Listen what, let's implement some laws against dishonest politicians. Those should be fired immediately. Where are we going anyway as humans if we, ha if we have liars leading us? So basically most people are aware that their lives are governed to a large extent by evil represented by what they call big money or um, evil corporations. This is the name commonly used by most people. But very few people venture in their intellectual pursuits as far as uh, thinking that, well, after all, these evil forces don't exist by themselves. Uh, they are maintained by the legislative system that we accept and vote for absolutely voluntarily. For example, now on the screen I have outlined and written down a few very practical steps and very simple ones um, that could be implemented and they will result in a transition to a, an honest and much more sensible and beautiful society. It can be a bit difficult to read it on the screen, you can read it in the description of this video or on my Facebook account. And the beauty of the intentions behind this list is that they are universal for all parties. And if you belong to any political party, that is even better. You don't have to leave it. Let's say, for example, you are a Democrat. Although I, I can't even think of a single country that is having at the moment actual democracy, if we read the meaning of the word in the dictionary, this is a beautiful. Look at this, it represents the will of the people. So for any actual democratic party, the first step should be gaining independence from most of the international institutions, like for example European Union or various multinational uh, monetary funds. They are all governed by private people. They do not definitely represent the opinion of the majority. So getting independent of them should be like an immediate priority. For example, the European Union, all this talk about brotherhood of men and loving each other. What's the point of the talk when in reality the top officials, they are not voted by the people, they are placed there by I don't know whom, but they are always members of some secret society. I mean, like the very top, those who are the governors of the actual European Union, they are not elected by the people. Other such very similar organizations are the Federal Reserve and the International Monetary Fund. There is no question of anybody voting for the positions of those officials and yet they have more power than the presidents of the countries, all countries. They manage the world money supply and in this way they rule most of the human activity, at least in these three dimensions that most people call reality. Almost everything depends on money. So if a given party has put somebody on a train called a journey to democracy, to the fairy land of democracy, then the first step should be making international institutions like the ones I just uh, listed absolutely illegal. Not only because they could interfere with the rule of people or rule of majority, but also because they have proven that they are doing so in a very evil way. And then let's read further this wonderful definition. We read here free elections. I take it to mean honest elections. Uh, I don't know if that even exists, but um, all democratic parties have very long way to go before even this fantasy train departs for the dreamland of democracy. And until the basics are set like honest uh, elections with honest counting, Till then, regardless of how many people actually want to face this truth, the naked truth is that we live in the social system of plutocracy, which means rule of the rich.
Then let's get back to this definition, it's a really wonderful one, about democracy, the absence of hereditary or arbitrary class distinctions or privileges. Yeah, before we reach the democratic dreamland, first of all, we'll have to change the laws and make this unhealthy hoarding of money illegal, because it's such a poison for the human society. The richest clans or families in the world, they have been ruling for centuries and the current laws give them even more power. So if you're a member of Democratic Party, you should make the other members aware that uh, your democracy is still very far away until laws are not in power that prevent this hereditary abuse of wealth. And then another necessary factor for democracy is the absence of uh, arbitrary privileges. What does this mean? It's exactly like in the case with IMF, the International Monetary Fund, this all-powerful world organization, where basically a small group of uh, 24 people of course, none of them is ever elected or voted by anybody. They govern the worldwide distribution and creation of wealth. In simple words, they create billions just by typing numbers on their computers and then pressing enter. And then this money uh, are distributed to various sm smaller organizations which uh, further reinforce this network of evil around there the world. There is no question of any democracy until uh, such institutions exist. And uh, currently, they are arbitrary in essence, but they are not arbitrary officially, because arbitrary means unlawful. Uh, they are fully lawful. Just people don't know about these uh, laws, because um, it looks uh, too complex for them to delve into. But they should be delving too if they are interested in their personal freedom. And it is not that difficult. Actually, behind the very complicated financial terms stay very, very plain and simple things. Or let's say you are a member of a party that uh, claims to support small businesses. Usually such parties just waste people's times by proposing some minor reforms like alleviating some particular small problem and pretend that they don't see the big picture, which is until this uh, central dishonest money supply system continues to exist, it is only gradually killing the small businesses because all this uh, money that is uh, manufactured and distributed, for example, by IMF on an upper level level and then other organizations uh, carried out on more local levels, at the end it results into multinational organizations buying off personal property in, and in the not so far away future the world will be legally owned by these uh, few selected groups because they get basically unlimited money for free. So instead of bamboozling people with endless unnecessarily complicated talk about smaller reforms, if a party really cares about the small businesses, it should address the main point that the big multinational organizations get unlimited money for free. It is, and in this way, it is only a question of time that they will be able to acquire, basically buy off everything that can be bought with money. There will be no small businesses of free people. Now, let's look at the case of the various political parties which supposedly stand for environmental protection. Again, lots of talking is done, and yet the results are minimum, if any at all. Why? So, in other words, these environmental projects proposed by them, 
depend on the existence of uh, this financial system of exchange which has been put in place and maintained by the forces of evil. And since it is exactly these forces of evil that want all this pollution to take place, how can a project which is in their jurisdiction have any success against pollution in the long, long term? It cannot, and it does not have such a success. So, actual parties that stand for protecting the environment, they should address the big issue, the existence of organizations that for which nobody is personally responsible. Usually it is through such type of uh, uh, setups that uh, the destruction of Mother Nature is carried out. And the second point is that the uh, killing of the wildlife and the uh, beauty of nature around is not considered even a crime. We need a significant change in the laws if we really want to preserve nature. And this issue is not at all addressed by the Green parties. So although the plan of action that I outlined is a very practical one, if you read it, and it's a relatively very easy one, the chances that it really happens hover around zero. Why? Because it's uh, bound to fail at its very beginning, where people should be spending a little bit of their time educating themselves about how, in very practical terms, all this project of legalizing evil, making it the norm, is being carried out. For example, I think more than 99% of the people on the planet are uh, of the opinion that big money and big corporations rule the world. But how many people take it one step further and follow the logic to the next step? But wait a minute, if money rules the earth, if everything is about money, then what about the people who govern the money, who manage the money? People of the level like I was mentioning IMF or the rich clans who manage other organizations like the Federal Reserve. These people are not after money. They cannot be after money because they create all the money. If they want more money, it is as easy as uh, pressing uh, 7 billion on their computer and then enter. And all this is completely lawful. How many people ask themselves what are the actual intentions and ideas of the people who are above money? Why are they creating this situation on earth? For example, they are not independent, they belong to clans, they belong to families that have been around for hundreds of years. Don't they have that much common sense to see that if they destroy the planet that they live on, their successors will have nothing to rule, for example? Well, there is no lack of information about things. A lot of uh, investigative journalists taking uh, significant risks have revealed a lot of this. And at the end, it boils down at what we started this video with, the angels, and how before it was angels amongst people, and now it is evil angels amongst people. Because all these clans that are above money, they are all into secret occult groups that are up to no good. And this evil monetary system is a very low level instrument of, for implementing what they have in mind. And what they have in mind, well, maybe it's not that difficult to figure out, given the fact that they worship all kinds of devils. So let's summarize where have we reached so far. I had a wonderful plan, which unfortunately will not work because not enough people will be willing to adopt it. 
And then following this viewpoint from which the comments to which I respond were geared in the sense of um, that humanity is kind of an innocent victim of some evil that comes from outside, maybe aliens or like a group of people on our earth, it doesn't matter, but it's certainly an outside force that... Um, affects the otherwise good innocent people if we continue standing at this uh, viewpoint there isn't much hope left uh, uh, evil is too strong if we view it in this perspective and uh, then that's why many people are talking that the only hope is that some angels or aliens or god will just come and save us but my personal perspective of the full situation, of the full problem is completely different. And I was hoping that with my survivor's uh, documentary, I will inspire more people to look inside and um, see the outside problems as a manifestation of something unwanted in themselves, instead of constantly blaming others. But this didn't work so well, I did not manage to achieve my goal and based on the surveys that I um, did less than 1% of the viewers made the conclusions that I was expecting them to make and others they just uh, preferred to remain in their paradigm of the innocent victims and that's why when I posted recently this amazing interview with uh, Carlos Tanner, it got much less views than the historical documentaries. Relatively less people wanted to hear what he has to share, simply because they thought, but I'm not interested in this stuff, I'm interested in history. But I see things otherwise. For me, the very opportunity, amazing opportunity to be able to talk with such people like Carlos, it's like talking to some of our forefathers from one or two thousand years ago as if he is alive and understanding their mindset of how we live in an universe where everything around is alive. And the wisdom from him is really special because he is not just imagining that everything is alive and preaching it because he read it somewhere. He has developed direct perception of how to communicate with the plants. And uh, he and many other shamans have proven again and again that this is not some sort of imagination or hallucination, for example, in diagnosing people. And in terms of this uh, problem about the evil taking over the planet and um, the supposedly innocent humanity which seems to be losing the battle for now, I will quote again Carlos Tanner, he said something very wise. Instead of endlessly speculating about how things should be according to our understanding of good and bad, it will be much more beneficial to try to understand how things are. In other words, it will be much more beneficial to try to see how actually the law of karma functions instead of spending hours thinking how it should be functioning according to our understanding. And here I'm gonna present my own perspective of this uh, full situation and problem of um, evil taking over the planet. And uh, more precisely, the very idea of saving humanity from this evil. Humanity as a whole cannot be ever saved from this evil because humanity itself emanates this evil. This evil is only a projection of the majority of thoughts that humans have in their psyche. Imagine somebody commits a bad action because somebody else instigated him to do so. Although the instigator can be held responsible to some extent, the main responsible person is the one who actually committed the act. Now another simple example, you are selling something and you are making somewhat of a dubious advertisement which uh, presents the product in a somewhat misleading light but you think it's okay because everybody else is doing so because the world nowadays is like this i'm good but i'm doing something not so right because i'm forced by the circumstances 
In reality, you are not forced and you do have other options to earn money in an honest way. You just don't want to do it and you are having these excuses and thoughts just because you are not mature enough to take responsibility of your own actions. And the same applies in global scale. The humanity as a whole is simply not mature enough to face the consequences of its own thought creations, thought forms, and that's why prefers to view it from the perspective of some external evil taking over humanity. And that is what I was hoping to achieve, to revive this message of our forefathers that the universe around is alive, it responds to our thoughts, each and every thought we have results in action, the world around behaves according to our thoughts. This is uh, like a basic understanding of the people that lived in the past. It's evident from whatever little writing has survived and legend legends have survived from those times. But I could not achieve the goal I set in mind. From the comments and from the countless emails, people still continued to stick to this perspective that uh, we are innocent and we have been cheated. I got countless messages because of the survivors documentary and people were persistently asking about we need much more details about the parasites, where do they come from, how do they look like, which party are they and so on and so on and I I'm not interested in spreading any such information because um people will immediately make it a pivotal point in their thoughts. They will really start persistently meditating on them. Don't forget that you become whatever you meditate on. And in reality, in the forces of evil, they own and maintain lots of uh, so-called um, alternative uh, news outlets. And um, it, it works in their favor they spread all these uh, stories of how highly technological extraterrestrial sources are taking over humanity and people cannot do anything about it. They will provide, for example, details of how our bodies are being uh, poisoned but by all kinds of uh, medicines, radiation, etc. And no solution no way out of this situation and this is the most important thing for them to create this uh, attitude that we the people are helpless which is not the case we have the power of our thoughts and another simple example imagine a person living in a really bad society, crime all around, just no social law, you cannot get a job because everything is rotten with corruption. And one day this person decides, I'm fed up to live with these bad people. And he just goes and lives in a completely different environment where like uh, polite people live, there are fewer uh, poor people because um, the laws are respected by the citizens there is employment for everybody, things like that. And what do the statistics show? What happens to this type of people? When they get to the new environment and start living over there, they don't abandon their criminal ways. Although they can become noble citizens and uh, start some sort of uh, honest job, something like that, they prefer to stick to their old ways of uh, stealing and being rude and all that. Very few actually change their ways when they arrive in the new environment. So no matter how much we love to think that we're actually angels, but all the other people around are the bad ones, the reality is that we have taken birth in this difficult environment with evil all around because we have manifested it ourselves and what we are here to learn is how to manifest a beautiful world around us. We are not here to teach the other people what is good or bad. 
Although we interact, we still continue to live in a very much of a personal reality, personal world, each and every one of us, because we uh, interpret and perceive the things around in a very different way. We are not here to tell the others what to do and what is good or bad. The law of karma will teach them automatically. Each and every one is born here with the sole purpose of our own personal development. There is no problem at all with the world around. If the forces of evil decide to nuke it all and blow it all to pieces tomorrow, that is not a problem. The engineers, the creators of this universe, can manifest unlimited more planets and worlds like ours. And no matter on which planet or in which sphere we take birth in what kind of body, what matters is that our belief system will remain with us and it will continue to emanate all these ideas and thought forms which will create the realities around us no, ma no matter where we go. Now let's look at the actual shackles with which evil has enslaved humanity. Well, basically this would be the financial system and the armed forces. Now both of these are run by humans like us. Yes, there could be a master mind that comes from a non-human source and I think there is from other dimensions, but it has been our choice to decide to listen to their advices and ideas. We ourselves brought up children that would one day enroll in the army and kill people just to get paid. And what is even more bizarre is that after seeing the what we have done, we still continue to vote for people who maintain all this. And here comes another extremely important point, that our very idea of what good and bad is, has been perverted. I think the most vivid example of it is that um, since childhood we indoctrinate our children that uh, going and killing other people in the name of patriotism is something good. And what is a patriotism, the essence of it? The old belief of respecting and honoring the land you live on has been turned into an ugly belief that you should fiercely and ruthlessly defend the patch of land, borders of which have been drawn by the forces and evil so that they can divide and conquer. That's the purpose of having countries. When you start thinking in terms of us and those other people, then the ground is prepared for a conflict. Then the next step is to lie to you that those are bad and are coming to kill you. So the essence of patriotism is singing hymns and glorification of this evil system. There will be no freedom for humanity until it doesn't take off its self-imposed shackles the shackles of its twisted belief system. The example of the patriotism was just one out of the many. Another example, somebody mistreats us, insults us, is rude to us. We tend to respond with anger and we assume that this is an automatic inbuilt response, but it is not, it is something that we have learned when we were young. Many assume that this is natural and automatic and cannot be reversed, but it is not. It is just that we believe that this is the way things work. And we believe so because we have seen it countless times, especially when we were young. But there is another way to react. It is to respond with kindness and actually help the person instead of punching him. Imagine you yourself one day go crazy or for some reason you are rude, would you like to be punched back? Or would you like the people to be kind to you, to invite you to meditate together with them, or invite you for some sort of celebration? But the vast majority of people who now live on Earth are not interested in this type of uh, 
self-improvement. They find it more comfortable to spend their life struggling for survival or simply being hypnotized by the stream of information freely coming out of their cell phone or the TV. Even to the point that uh, they cut the very branch that they're sitting on and still they will continue maintaining these beliefs. Oh, we are just innocent victims of uh, big corporations or something that they are innocent victims of aliens, others think that they are innocent victims of Jews or pretty much anything else. Yet others fall into different traps, like for example this expectation and idea that the salvation will come from higher source. We are powerless, that's why we can only pray and wait. And what's the point, after all, of all this theater? Because we are souls that come into human bodies to participate in this educational theater. What's the point of all this? Why are the devils dis uh, instigating this destruction of everything beautiful? Why? Because God has sent them to test us, to see if we'll believe them when they whisper in our years you see everybody is lying and cheating if you don't do it as well you can't survive and also will humanity find power within to overthrow its self-imposed shackles and when also doesn't really even matter much because everybody lives in their own personal reality even though we share a common stage for this theater and what really matters at the end is will you believe the devil when it whispers in your ear to lie and kill and be mean and angry to others? Will you buy into his words and will you do what he tells you? That's what matters and if you find yourself in very difficult situations during this life, they are nothing else but tests. Thank you for listening and don't forget that the philosophical views expressed in this video are not only my personal, they are fully confirmed by people who have had genuine near-death experiences and also people who have memories for their experiences in between lives, when the souls choose their destiny for the next life. Those who are not very familiar with the concept of uh, manifesting one's reality, the events around with the power of our thoughts, may find my suggestions in terms of uh, dealing with uh, the forces of evil in the current moment somewhat impractical. To such people it may sound like, okay, so practically we don't do anything and we wait that they kill and poison us and uh, we uh, wait for some fantasies to come true or maybe not but in reality the laws of karma work for those who understand them and for those who do not if we just cut the trunk of a tree and the roots remain alive those small branches will continue to grow and they will turn into bush again it will not die and in the same way, imagine by some miracle, tomorrow all the forces of evil that were tormenting humanity since maybe thousands of years, they evaporate, they don't exist anymore. This will not alleviate our suffering much because we'll be, we will victimize ourselves because we will still continue to act according to the belief system we have already acquired and in this system there is place for jealousy, envy, hatred, aggression, revenge and so on. Let's clarify this with one very good example. Imagine two people that have the same problem. They're diagnosed with some 
a very bad fatal disease and the prognosis is that uh, they're expected to die very soon. One of them thinks that uh, we die, our, our identity ceases to exist when our body dies and the other person is uh, convinced that we simply go to other state and we continue to exist. It is not that scary. Now, how will these two people react to the same news? Ironically enough, the person who thinks that he will actually not die and who is in less panic will take wiser decision than the one who just goes into full panic mode and in this way cannot think straight about possible cures of his disease and also uh, because of his uh, negative thoughts and strain on the nervous system he actually decreases his uh, chances to live uh, longer because he's stressing himself. Now from the perspective of the stressed person the one who believes in eternal life may seem like an impractical dreamer who doesn't understand the seriousness of the situation with the fatal disease. But yet, it is exactly the so-called impractical dreamer that has much better practical chances of improving the situation. Even in the case that both people at the end, live the same amount of time, still the so-called impractical dreamer is in a far off better situation because he will live, let's say, the last month of his life in dreams about angels and uh, expecting something good to happen to him and basically making the best out of uh, his last days on earth and what will be the other so-called practical person doing with his time? He will just, he will just agonize himself even more.